Hello and welcome to today's webinar. I'm uh, extremely excited to be here with you today to talk to you about this very important topic. Now this is part two of our webinar series on anti-dumping and countervailing and today we're going to be talking specifically about how you can mitigate the risks of anti-dumping and countervailing. My name is Tyler Zeichkin. I've been in the international trade industry now for five years and I, I, I couldn't be more excited to talk to you about this today. With me on uh, the webinar is my associate, Jaron Anderson. He's a national underwriting and claims manager here at TRG and a licensed customs broker, one of our many licensed customs brokers here on staff. Now, Trade Risk Guarantee, as you know, if you've been in some of our previous webinars, is located just about 60 minutes away, about an hour away from Yellowstone National Park in beautiful Bozeman, Montana. We were established in 1991, and for the last 25 years, our direct-to-importer business model has allowed us to work with over 10,000 companies just like yours. We work with them on these required niche insurance products, U.S. customs bonds, and cargo insurance, but that's not what we're talking about here today. Today, we're talking about anti-dumping and countervailing. So you can join the conversation and talk with us on our, in our Facebook group, International Trade Professionals-TRG. After the webinar, we'll send out a link that'll send you right to this group. Join the group. Come join the conversation. This is a great place to get your questions answered as well as to meet with other professionals in this international trade community. Now let's get started. Today's webinar topic, we are, we're covering a lot less topics than last time, but arguably just or as important or more important, especially when coming to protecting your business. So we're going to go over briefly what are anti-dumping and countervailing duties. We're going to go over the anti-dumping and countervailing timeline, both the timeline with the, the uh, investigation process and the timeline of the reviews being the annual reviews and the sunset reviews. And then finally, we're going to talk about how to protect your business and mitigate your risk when bringing in goods subject to anti-dumping and countervailing. So what are anti-dumping and countervailing duties? Well, anti-dumping duties are a protectionist tariff imposed on foreign imports believed to be priced below market value and causing material harm to the domestic market. Remember from the last webinar that both of those requirements must be met. It must be priced below market value and cause material harm to the domestic market. Countervailing duty, on the other hand, is a protectionist tariff imposed on foreign imports believed to be subsidized by a foreign government and causing material harm to the domestic market. And again, both must be met. It cannot just be a subsidized product. It must also um, cause harm to the domestic market. So we talked about the five-point investigation timeline in the last webinar, and we talked about the different responsibilities for the Department of Commerce and the U.S. International Trade Commission. So remember that what commerce is doing in an investigation of whether or not a good uh, or a product could be subject to anti-dumping or countervailing duties is Commerce is looking at whether or not there is dumping or financial assistance provided by that foreign government. So that's one of those requirements, right, is is it dumping or is it receiving financial assistance? The ITC, the US ITC, is looking at whether or not there's injury to the domestic market. So they have different responsibilities here. And after the, the petition is filed, um, the initial initiation of investigation first starts with the Department of Commerce, who is looking into that first piece of whether or not dumping is occurring or whether or not a, a foreign good is being subsidized. That moves on next to the preliminary investigation by the USITC, who is doing their preliminary investigation of whether or not there's injury to the domestic market. And then next, the preliminary investigation by the Department of Commerce, where they're looking further into whether or not there's dumping or financial assistance being given. If that preliminary investigation is affirmative, and this is something that we all need to remember, if that preliminary investigation is affirmative, that is where the suspension of entry starts. Commerce will order customs to suspend liquidation of entries and start collecting cash deposits, and they even give an initial rate at this point of what that cash deposit should be. Now, Commerce then moves immediately into their final determination where they make that final determination on whether or not the foreign uh, company is dumping or receiving financial assistance, and then the final determination by the USITC regarding the injury to the domestic market. 
If the final determination is affirmative in both cases with both the Department of Commerce and the USITC, then that, that final determination order is issued and anti-dumping duties start being collected on all of the goods being imported that fall under the scope. Now, when do those entries liquidate? Well, that has to do more now with the review timeline. So we didn't look at this last time, but the review timeline is, is an important piece to be looking at. So a year after the final determination is issued, interested parties may request in the first in the month of the first anniversary uh, an administrative review. And what that is, is essentially the Department of Commerce is looking to determine the final rate for the last period of anti-dumping entries or countervailing entries, as well as determining the rate for the next period. Now, this may take months or years to complete. And when I say years, I mean years. It could be a year, it could be two years, it could be three years. We've seen eight years. It can take a long time. And the reason is, is that Commerce is, if there's an issue where the, the case gets taken into litigation or, or into the court system, or there's an issue with lack of information, Commerce doesn't have a specific timeline where the annual review process has to be completed. So we've seen it as, as a surety agency, we see a lot of these that take multiple years. As a reminder, the review period doesn't have to happen. Um, if it's not requested, what happens is, is all of the entries in the first period liquidate at the rate of the final determination, and then the new entries for the next period continue in that same rate determined as the last period. So um, it can keep happening. But it's important that that everyone kind of understands this process and it remains the same. So you've got the first review period, the second review period follows the same guidelines as the previous and so on and so forth until we get to the sunset review. Now, the sunset review is very similar. They're still looking at whether or not to or what rate to to liquidate the entries at. But what they're also looking at, and, and this is automatically initiated, so it happens no matter what, what they're also looking at is whether or not there needs to be a continuation of the anti-dumping or countervailing duty. And that's really important. So both the Commerce and the USITC are involved in this process here at the end. Step five, the sunset review, and, and they're looking at both. Now, it could happen where, where they say, yes, affirmative, it keeps going. And there are many cases where they, they will say, no, it doesn't look like there's either material harm to the U.S. market and or they're not dumping or, or receiving financial assistance at this time. So anti-dumping doesn't have to go on forever. It can stop. We see this sometimes with goods coming in, whether it be tires from China or, or bearings. We've seen some of these things recently where it's been decided that it's no longer necessary. So it doesn't always continue, but often it, it does. So now that we've looked into it a little bit further as far as the timelines and, and, and the definitions, how do you stop your business from going up in flames? And, and that's, that's really what it comes down to. At the end of the day, a lot of us here are, are in this compliance world. And so what we're trying to do is protect our business and mitigate the risks that we have. So let's talk about a few of the ways that you may do that for your business. So the first thing is, is truly to, to understand the entire process. And that's why we talked about it in this webinar. That's why we talked about it in the previous webinar. It's why we have blog articles about it. It's why everyone writes and talks about this is because understanding anti-dumping and countervailing is imperative to your business's long-term success. If you're going to be bringing in imports at all, um, you should understand anti-dumping and countervailing. And here's a few things that I, I think are really important. One is, is understanding that initial petition that is filed, understanding that the, the material injury and the less than fair value pieces of that. Uh, understand the investigation and the roles that both the U.S. Department of Commerce and the U.S. International Trade Commission play in the investigation process. Understand the suspended entries and why your entries are being suspended, what that means how when they get the initial preliminary determination why they're suspended there and how they work all the way through and then the the you know the review period and the liquidation timelines understanding those understanding the annual review process and the sunset review process all of this is extremely important uh, and, and again, whether or not you're bringing it in good subject to anti-dumping and countervailing is almost a moot point. If you're not bringing it in, it could almost be more important that you understand it. So, so really getting a grasp of the entire process, the entire idea behind it, what it does, why it's there. We talked about the history last time. All of that plays into a total, complete understanding of the anti-dumping and countervailing duty process 
and I would encourage you to learn as much as you can about it. So the next step is, is truly to monitor new petitions. And I, again, this is as important for someone who's not bringing goods subject to anti-dumping as someone who currently brings in goods subject to anti-dumping or countervailing. I've given a couple of links here. First is for new petitions. Those can be filed on the uh, usitc.gov website, usitc.gov forward slash petitions underscore and underscore complaints. This includes petitions for both anti-dumping and countervailing and issues with, with copyright infringement. So um, what we're looking at here when looking at this list, anti-dumping and countervailing uh, cases are going to be under, or petitions are going to be under type 731 and 701. So when looking at this list, uh, pay special attention to those. And then once you know the new petitions that are being filed, which, which there are new petitions being filed every week, this list is updated regularly, you should be looking at the next piece, which is the open investigations. Remember that that investigation typically happens about 20 days after the petition is filed, so the process starts moving quickly, so it's important to be paying attention, and I would encourage you to be looking at, at new petitions and open investigations every week, and, and if that's too much, every other week, but, but really, really often. So the open investigations are also on the usitc.gov website. You can see the entire link here, and I encourage you to be reviewing those regularly as a good way, again, whether or not your goods are subject to anti-dumping and countervailing now, they could be uh, in a few months. So, so really pay attention to these. If you want to avoid it altogether, you're, you see a petition, you see an investigation, you, you start worrying, well, what do I do now? One of the easiest ways to avoid paying anti-dumping and countervailing duties is to not bring in goods subject to anti-dumping and countervailing. And to do that, I would encourage you to look for alternative suppliers. Specifically, orders are country and, and within the country often manufacturer specific. So to avoid paying these duties and, and being caught up in this and the, the liquidation and having all your money tied up in these different pieces, choose an alternate country. You know, with, with the world economy the way it is right now, we've got a lot of opportunities to import from countries other than, than some of the main ones we've done in the past. And I would encourage you to, to possibly look into to alternative manufacturers or suppliers of your goods if that's a possibility. Now, if it's not, and in many cases it won't be, look to find a manufacturer with a preferred rate. And we're going to talk a little bit more about preferred rates here in a second, but that can be a way to pay a, a lesser duty and to work with a, a manufacturer that may be a, a more compliant with what uh, CBP, the USITC, and the Department of Commerce are looking for from foreign manufacturers or suppliers. Next. We're going to get into this next big topic, which is really about knowing your cases. And I think one of the first things you need to know when looking at any case is the scope. Um, and, and the scope is really important. And when you're looking at what the scope is, is it defines the product or products that fall under the anti-dumping or countervailing duty order. So what I would encourage you to look at is the description as well as the listed HTS US numbers. The important piece when looking at those HTS US numbers is to remember that those are only provided for convenience and they help out customs and they can help out you by giving you an idea of kind of where they're at, but they're not the final determination. To, to truly understand if your goods are subject to the anti-dumping or countervailing duty order, you need to be reading the description, not just the numbers. The final determination of subjectivity must be determined by the written description in the scope, not just the HTS US code. So, so look into that. So we're going to uh, look at an example here today. We're going to look at po large power transformers from South Korea and, and go a little bit further into looking at the scope right now. So here's the scope. Large uh, power transformers from South Korea, subject to anti-dumping and countervailing duties. Here's the scope. Um, what we're looking at are large liquid dielectric power transformers having a top power handling capacity greater than or equal to 60,000 kilovolt amperes. And I'm not going to go through the whole scope here, but you'll see it all listed. Um, these are either assembled or assembled. Or assembled or unassembled, excuse me, complete or incomplete. And it goes through all the different processes of what it falls under, what the active part is, you know, whether it has steel core or shell, the windings, the electrical installation. I mean, it goes over every piece specifically. And this is to help um, you determine whether or not your goods are subject to this order. So again, more descriptions, um, you know, including but not limited to step up transformers, step down transformers, auto transformers, 
all of these different things. And at the very end, it gives you three different um, subheadings that these may be classifiable under. And the most important part here, though, and the part I wanted to get to right here at the end of the scope um, that you should be paying attention to is this last line, which is, although the HTS US subheadings are provided for convenience and customs purposes, the written description of the scope of this order is dispositive, which means that that is the piece that really matters. That at the end of the day, that if your goods fall under a new HTS US code, or, or for some reason, they're, they're just a little bit different than the three provided here, it still is subject to the anti-dumping and countervailing duty order. The, the HTS US number does not define whether or not it is subject to the order or the scope. What does is the description. So that is what you should be looking at. Use the HTS codes uh, as a, a good place to start, but don't assume your goods aren't subject to the, to the order if they don't fall under those codes. The next thing you should know, now you've looked at the scope, you've said, yep, my goods are subject to it. What else do I need to know about this case? Well, you should know all the case numbers. And there's three different case numbers I believe you should be paying attention to. The first being the case number from the Department of Commerce. This is also the case number that is typically referenced by U.S. Customs. And that's going to be an A, a dash, and then three digits, a dash, and three more digits, or a C and the same following. The Department, or excuse me, the U.S. ITC has a similar structure. It's going to be an A dash four digits or C dash three digits. And then finally, the Federal Registrar is going to have a structure of two space FR and then four or five digits after that. So the three examples for what we're looking at here today would be A dash 580 dash 867, A dash 1189, or 77 space FR space 53177. So again, these all three of these you should know, but the two most important that you're going to be referencing the most often are going to be the top number, A-580-867, which is the, the Department of Commerce number, same number referenced by Customs, and then finally that the Federal Registrar number. Uh, the reason why you want to know these is, is when you're researching the cases, um, you're going to be looking at both of these. The Federal Registrar is going to have uh, information regarding updates on the case, um, and you'll want to be looking there as well as on the Department of Commerce website, the CBP website, um, and the ITC website. Next, um, I encourage you to really pay attention to dates. You should know the dates of everything that has happened with the goods that are subject to antidote and countervailing from the very begin beginning when that, that preliminary determination happened through every sunset review, annual review, all of it. You should have all of the dates put together and, and I'm not saying you should memorize them, but you should definitely know them and, and, and have them written down and be paying attention to them. So here are the dates for our example right now. The preliminary determination date was on February 16th, 2012. The final determination happened on July 11th, 2012. The duty order was issued on August 31st, 2012. There wasn't a first annual review requested. And so the first period liquidation happened on October 2nd, 2013. Let's talk about why these dates are important. We're going to get here um, by talking a little bit about the liquidation status. So when you're knowing your cases, you should know where your goods are being held up. Are they suspended? Are they liquidated? Has the liquidation order been issued? Um, if it has, has customs liquidated the, the goods yet? All of these things are things you should be paying attention to. So just for reference, a, a non-anti-dumping or countervailing duty entry typically liquidates within 314 days of the entry date. With anti-dumping and countervailing duty entries, liquidation is often extended due to a lot of factors, but primarily litigation or lack of available information for annual reviews. And so, again, this can last a year, two years, five years, eight years. It can be a long period of time, uh, a lot longer than the 314 days of a non-antidumping or countervailing duty entry. And so it can take a long time for the order to be issued, and it can take a long time for customs to liquidate the, the goods after the order has been given to them by the Department of Commerce. Uh, customs has six months after that date to, to liquidate the entries. So it's extremely important that once that order has been issued by the Department of Commerce, that 
you're watching customs to make sure the entry is also being liquidated by customs. So there's a lot to pay attention here. And so I encourage you to monitor the liquidation status closely to ensure proper timing, proper duty rates, and, and, and accuracy. So all of this plays together and into our, our example here of these large power transformers from South Korea. So as I mentioned before, uh, when talking about dates, the liquidation order was issued on October 2nd, 2013 by the Department of Commerce. And this addressed liquidation instructions for entries made from August 1st, 2012 to July 31st, 2013. The problem is, as we know, this was the, the first annual review or, the, or at least the first liquidation period. And that should go all the way back to the preliminary determination. But Commerce messed up. They did. They messed up and they didn't issue an order all the way back to the beginning. And this is exactly why you should be paying attention. These types of mistakes happen frequently. And it's your responsibility. These are your goods. These are your companies that you're trying to protect. You should be paying attention to every single date, every single order, and tracking it, making sure things are done correctly. So um, again, the order failed to address entries made from the preliminary determination to the final determination. So they did. They issued uh, about a month and a half later. Um, Commerce did issue a corrected order and that addressed the liquidation instructions for all of the period entries from 2-16-2012, which was that, that preliminary determination date, all the way to the end of the period on July 31st, 2013. But if you weren't paying attention, this could have easily been missed and, and your issues could have remained unliquidated for any period of time. And, and that's extremely important because your money is tied up until those goods are liquidated. So <clears throat> those are the things I want you to know about your cases, the things I believe that are extremely important about the anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases. The next thing, um, you, you know everything. What else can you do to protect your business? At the end of the day, one of the only ways to protect yourself is to make sure that if these entries liquidate at a higher duty rate than anticipated, higher than the deposit rate, that you have the cash reserves necessary to, to make sure that your business continues to be successful. And we're going to talk about that now. So often, <coughs> antidemic and countervailing duty cases liquidate at rates higher than, the est than established in the investigation or the review periods. And so a cash reserve ensures that your business is prepared for these unexpected increases. My rule of thumb is to review the difference in anti-dumping and countervailing duty rates to determine your company's reserve amount. And we're going to use the same example here to look at this right now. So let's, let's first look at from the preliminary determination to, to um, when these goods the liquidation order was issued. Let's look at kind of the entire rate process. So for large power converters um, from South Korea, they're split into three different rates for the preliminary determination deposit rates. So all other or the countrywide rate was 29.93%. Hyosung was at a higher rate at 38.07%. And then Hyundai was at a lower rate or, or what I would call preferred rate at 21.79%. So this was the preliminary determination, which we know is not what, what is the final rate used for that first period, but it is a good indication of the types of rates that we may see for the anti-dumping or countervailing duty import. During the final determination, the rates were lowered, which is really good to see. We'll see that, that all of them were lowered um, around 7, 8, 9 percent. You know, all other was lowered to 22 percent of the countrywide rate. Hyosung um, went down to 29.04 percent, uh, a 9 percent decrease. And then Hyundai went down to 14.9 percent. Now, because these goods didn't have a first annual review per period, these were liquidated at these rates. But we're going to use these now to determine what a good cash um, reserve would be for these goods in case there was a change at the next annual review period. So here's my rule of thumb, finding the difference between the next highest rate. So if you're importing from Hyundai, you want to look at the difference between the country red rate and the Hyundai rate, which is 7.05%. So my recommendation would be consider keeping about a 7%, 7.05% cash reserve. If you're importing at the countrywide rate, I would urge you to consider keeping the difference of the rate between Hyosung and all other, which is 
And then if you're importing from Hyosung, I would encourage you to keep the average of the difference, which is 7.045%. In all of these cases, what this does is it ensures that if there is a change in rate, if if this does change over time, which it often does, it often liquidates at a higher rate, you have the reserves on hand to protect your business. So that's what we talked about today. We talked about three different pieces here. Uh, we talked about what are anti-dumping and countervailing duties. We went over the anti-dumping and countervailing uh, timeline. Uh, and we specifically uh, talked about not only the timeline for the uh, initial investigation process, but also the review process and that timeline. And then finally, we talked about a lot of different ways that you can protect your business. Here are some additional resources, and we're going to be sending out a, a big list of links here um, after the webinar today that will help you have a lot of resources put together uh, when you're researching these cases. And, and before we leave, though, I wanted to, to talk to you about a couple other things, which is if you are new to anti-dumping and countervailing, if what I'm telling you today is, is like a foreign language and it's extremely difficult to understand, you've watched the first webinar, it's also extremely difficult to understand, I'd, I'd encourage you to consider consulting with a specialized attorney. And when I say specialized attorney, I don't just mean a customs attorney. I, I mean an attorney that specializes in anti-dumping and countervailing duty case law. And, and they're going to be able to help you more than anyone navigate this extremely difficult to understand world of anti-dumping and countervailing. But at the end of the day, it may be one of the least expensive ways that, that you can truly protect your business. Next, um, and, uh, and again, this is something that you, you may or may not agree with at the end of the day, but it's something that I did because I think it's very important, which is, is you know, I, when I read about, um, and I called the Department of Commerce and spoke with them about the, the time frame of these liquidation, these annual review processes, and I, and I asked, uh, how long do these need to last, or how long do these last, and, and I was told, they can last years at a time and and there are mistakes made and there's litigation and and there's lack of available information and there's lack of resources to get all of these annual review processes done and my thought immediately went to that's that's so difficult on businesses of all sizes from small businesses to medium large businesses all of them struggle because all of their money can be tied up in these anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases so my personal belief is is that these should liquidate at a year, if they're unable to to settle uh, litigation, if they're unable to collect information, if they don't have the resources to get these annual review processes done, there should be a time frame set on on how long um, the Department of Commerce has to to issue these liquidation orders. So I wrote my my senator and and asked him to consider um, a bill that that may specifically state a year to liquidate these entries, and if they haven't completed it within a year, uh, the annual review process, then they'll liquidate at that the initial rate in the preliminary determination or the last annual review. Um, and I would encourage you to consider doing the same, because at the end of the day, this is the only way that we're going to be able to make a change. And if you've been caught in that three, four, five, six, seven, eight year time frame where your goods are remaining unliquidated, you understand how hard this can be. So this is an encouragement. I'm not saying you need to. I'm not saying a year is the right answer. Um, you know, I'm, I'm some guy here in, in Bozeman, Montana, making recommendations. But um, I would, would very much encourage you to consider uh, taking the next step to try and change some of these laws um, to, to better help businesses thrive in this international community. So we're going to get into questions here in just a second. So if you have some questions, um, please do uh, submit those using the chat option. Um, before that, I want to go quickly into um, just a, a little bit about Trade Risk Guarantee again and remind you that we are a, a unique business in that we work directly with importers and exporters on cargo insurance as well. Um, and, and that's our business model. We work directly with you. So rather than through a customs broker or a freight forwarder, we want to work directly with importers and, and have a pulse on this community. Um, Working with us typically saves you time and money with our customs bond. We allow you to purchase up to five years at a time, um, saving you a lot of time in the renewal process, as well as money um, with our, our uh, 
or five-year term being as low as 225 a year. Um, you can continue working with any customs broker or freight forwarder. And as we bring on Jaren here in a second, you'll see that we do have uh, in-house claims assistance from licensed customs brokers as well. Um, so that when an anti-dumping claim does come up, you've got professional assistance um, from people who deal with this on a regular basis. So uh, let's go into a couple of questions. And as we get started, um, quick question um, from uh, Peggy, when you say the first annual uh, first anniversary for review, does that mean the first year the order is in place? Um, and this isn't so it, it does mean the first year, but it means back further than that. So it goes from that first annual review is to determine the rate from the preliminary determination to uh, a year from the final determination. So you'll see later, as we talked about this, um, that with the example, excuse me, with the example, um, it went back much further than that, about a year and a half. Um, typically after that, it's going to be a year exactly. Um, now here um, with Jaron, I got a couple of questions um, for you as well. Um, and give me one second here and we'll get you going. Uh, Jaron, we got you on the line? Yep, I'm here. Hi, everyone. Perfect. So, uh, Jaron, a quick question uh, that we received after the last webinar. Is there an existing list of exporter companies that has been documented as a potential risk factor or a potential risk under the anti-dumping laws that can be reviewed by importers in the U.S.? Okay, so by using the Commerce Assigned Anti-Dumping and Countervailing Duty case numbers, you can go on to CBP's Anti-Dumping and Countervailing Duty Search website. Um, we'll provide that link to you. But there you can locate the final determination for those cases. Uh, under the final determination, there will be a list of companies that are subjected to, the, uh, to their specific anti-dumping or counter, countervailing duty uh, rates. Um, if the manufacturer that you're interested in is not on that list specifically, uh, it's possible that they are subjected to the countrywide rate. Um, another thing you could do on that website is enter the manufacturer name that you're interested in and see if uh, they return any results um, with their involvement in uh, anti-dumping or countervailing duty. Okay, that, that's perfect. Thank you so much for that, that information, Jaren. Hey, if, if someone um, isn't sure where to find the best information for the correct tariff codes, what, what website could they go to to help them out? All right, so a good website that we use here is Customs Ruling Online Search System, also known as the uh, CROSS website. Um, it, it's a useful tool for an, uh, an importer to use to locate the history on uh, some items that they might be importing or are planning to import. Um, it, it usually shows uh, rulings that have been requested by other importers under the same commodity, um, and you, you can kind of see where customs would go as far as associating uh, a tariff code on those products. Okay. Um, is there a way to cross-reference cross material descriptions to ensure that the correct tariff code is identified? So you can also request what's called a binding ruling from customs. Um, what customs will do is they'll ask you for specific questions on the goods, uh, a description, uh, what the goods are made of, et cetera, um, and they'll They'll review those items and determine what they believe the best classification for the product is. Um, it doesn't necessarily eliminate the risk of misclassification, but it does give you uh, a tangible item showing what the best possible tariff code is for your product. Okay, and we, we've talked about that before in a few of the, the previous webinars as well. And, and uh, uh, you know, personally, I would encourage you uh, to get binding rulings and, and especially from a, a um, custom center of excellence and expertise. Um, they have those all over the country. They're specific uh, to specific or they're specific to industries. And so if you do have a, a product, I would encourage you to, to get a binding ruling, but not just from the port, also um, from that center of excellence and expertise. Um, so, so Jaron, I, you know, when, when bringing in goods subject to anti-dumping and countervailing, sometimes what, um, what, what importers will find is is that their cust or not their customs broker, excuse me, the manufacturer may give them a a 
tariff code and say, here's the tariff code you should be using when you're importing this goods. Who, who is responsible um, for identifying the correct, correct tariff code? Can an importer use um, the number given to them by a manufacturer? So the importer is actually responsible for providing customs with the correct classification of their items. Uh, many importers rely on their brokers for this. Um, however, if the broker does file an incorrect classification or tariff code with customs and customs is made aware of this uh, incorrect classification, the importer will be responsible for ensuring that the issue is rectified. Um, oftentimes the broker will help throughout this process but um, it is ultimately the importer's responsible to, to clean up the issue or mitigate any uh, damages that might occur. Um, a good outline of the importer's responsibilities is labeled uh, nicely in 19 CFR 113.62, um, which outlines the basic importation and entry bond conditions. And that, that's a good place to start to see what, what areas the uh, importer is going to be responsible for on the importing side. Okay. Um, uh, if, if uh, or I guess, is there an organization um, that can assist with identifying the correct tariff codes or, or identifying if a tariff code qualifies for anti-dumping? Um, so identifying the correct tariff code, um, kind of going back to one of the questions we had before, a binding ruling is a good place to start for that. Knowing that the tariff code that you're going to be using to clear the item is uh, the best possible match for your product is is important. Um, but there's also a process to determine if your product falls within the scope order of the anti-dumping or countervailing duty cases. Uh, this process is well defined in 19 CFR 3, uh, 351.225. Um, it's called scope rulings and it, it clearly labels the process um, to to determine if your products are going to fall under an anti-dumping or countervailing duty case. Okay. Um, and then, then finally, one more question. Um, does CBP have a, a, a source that I can go to to answer some of these frequently asked questions about whether it's anti-dumping or other things? Yes, we've covered a lot of the, uh, the frequently asked questions today. Um, this was a great webinar. Thank you, Tyler. But there is a list that CBP provides um, and it will provide it in a link, but there's a, a general list of frequently asked questions that they have their answers to. Um, and it's a good source for, uh, for uh, answers that you might be looking for as well on the anti-dumping and countervailing duty process. Okay, well, great. Well, well thank you, Jaron, for the compliment. And thank you so much for being with us here today. We hope to have you in, in some more of our webinars here in the future and, and hopefully some more uh, licensed customs brokers from, from TRG as well. Um, so there's a couple more questions that I, I wanted to get through here uh, quickly. Uh, Craig asked, does, can, does the Canadian government address anti-dumping and countervailing in the same manner as USA? And, and Craig, I, I don't know. Um, you know, we, we deal specifically with uh, U.S. customs on these items, and, you know, every country has its own way of dealing with this. Um, as I mentioned in the last webinar, there has been some international law passed about this, um, so I encourage you to go back and, and watch that and read into the international law. It's based off of a lot of the U.S. law, so so there, I'm, I'm sure there are some similarities there, um, but I can't answer that specifically. Um, uh, Bob had asked about insurance companies um, um, being able to demand uh, collateral, um, and specifically letters of credit, which is something that, that we see from our sureties as well, um, typical in a, a anti-dumping um, situation. Um, you know, it, it's it's very difficult with, with anti-dumping and countervailing, as we've talked about and Jaron talked about today, with the importer being ultimately responsible um, for for HTS classification, um, it's the same thing for everything you do with imports. The the importer is ultimately liable um, for everything that happens, and with that, um, it, it's important to to understand that that even if a surety pays out on an anti-dumping or countervailing duty claim or any claim whatsoever. Um, the, the importer is still ultimately liable. The responsibility simply transfers um, from CBP uh, uh, to the surety. So the sureties want to make sure that, that they just don't have to pay out, um, whether that be with TRG or some of the sureties used by, by your customs broker or freight forwarder. And so it, it's often one of those cases that, that um, if, if you have entries stacking up over multiple years, um, 
these sureties are going to require that are, that are not being liquidated um, for whatever reason, which we talked about. That can be eight years that things aren't liquidating. The sureties often will require multiple letters of credit. So it, it may be the, the bond amount for two, three, or four years in a row um, to ensure that they have enough collateral to protect themselves in the case of a payout. So um, those are all the questions we're going to get here today. I see a couple more by Scott and, and uh, Mariana. Um, we will get to those here uh, in an email and on, on International Trade Professionals hyphen TRG on Facebook, that Facebook group we've talked about. Um, we'll get those answered as well. And if you have any other questions, feel free to email me, um, the group, or, or visit uh, the, excuse me, the Facebook group. And uh, you know, we want to help you out and answer as many questions as we can, as thoroughly as we can. I really appreciate you being here on the webinar today. Again, thank you so much. All of our contact information is here. Uh, we can't wait to see you on our next webinar.